1 Samuel 17, 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose. That's Goliath the giant, in case you didn't know. And came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted. That's a good old King James word. He got in a hurry. And he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. <clears throat> I want to speak to you today on facing your giant. God bless you. Please be seated. My goal today is to help you choose faith over fear. <clears throat> when you read your Bible, you will learn that this is not a book not a bunch of stories of superheroes who defeated inferior enemies. Instead, the Bible is a book of underdogs who became overcomers in spite of the obstacles. The people God uses are often overlooked, underrated Picked last or picked not at all and passed over. The Lord told the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, I did not set my love on you and choose you because you were more in number than any people, but because you were the fewest of all people. God said, I picked you because you were last because you were least. The courage of people of faith in the Bible is rooted in their relationship with God and a faith that there is nothing too hard with God, that with God all things are possible. And the people that have set the example for us in the Bible, they overcame obstacles that obstructed their path to victory because they had faith in Almighty God. I think it's important to say that we should always seek the face of God before we face our giants. For heaven's heroes are never focused on their human assets, but always on God's heavenly resources. The writer of Hebrews, speaking of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, says that out of weakness they were made strong. They did not start from a position of strength. They began with a position or posture of weakness. But it was out of that weakness that God gave them supernatural strength to overcome every obstacle. And underdogs became overcomers by the power of the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We are the people of faith. And we have to fight our way out of weakness. To be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might. The Bible heroes typically followed this same familiar path. From being underdogs to overcomers. Moses was a reluctant leader. Who lacked natural gifting. He was no orator, and yet he was called to be a spokesman for God. But what Moses lacked in eloquence, he made up in submission to God called meekness, the meekest or most submitted man that ever lived in that time. And so Moses could stand before Pharaoh, the leading president, king of the entire world, a world empire, and he could stand there and maybe stuttering say, let, let my people go. Yes. He saw God as greater than the giant that he faced in his life. He knew that he stood there in the stead of God and not on his own personal agenda. Moses found faith to face his giant because of his submission to God. Joshua and Caleb were men of faith. Moses sent 12 spies to check out the land of Canaan. Ten of those spies came back with a negative report that the Bible calls an evil report. They said the people of that land are giants. 
When we saw them, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers in their eyes. And then they saw us as grasshoppers in their own eyes. Because of the way we saw ourselves, we evoked a posture, a presence of grasshoppers, insignificant, underrated, unable. And so the giant saw us as an easy prey. In the mirror of self-reflection, they said, we are nobodies, grasshoppers, puny people, and the giants took their cue from them. But Joshua and Caleb had another spirit. They magnified God and minimized the giants. They said, don't rebel against the Lord. Don't be afraid of the people of this land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protectors, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. You see, ten spies were looking at the size of the giants. But two spies, Joshua and Caleb, were looking at the size of their God. Joshua would become the successor to Moses. And three times in the first chapter of Joshua, the Lord would have to encourage him. He is following this great prophet Moses. The Lord told him in Joshua 1 and 9, Be strong and have a good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Once again, Joshua's courage was rooted in a relationship with God and the promise that God would go with him. Joshua was an underdog who became an overcomer. I've always loved the story of Gideon, a reluctant leader. He lived in a season of time when the Midianites dominated Israel. Seven years in a row, they impoverished the land. They left the people of Israel languishing without anything to eat. And through all of this time, God finds a young man named Gideon. Gideon does not believe he is anything. But when God speaks to Gideon, he addresses him as a mighty man of valor. Gideon sees the enemy. He doesn't see his God. But eventually God flips the table. And with just 300 men armed with lamps and pitchers, Gideon defeats the armies of the enemies because he moves from a position of fear and hiding into a position of faith and he believes that there is nothing too hard for God. During the Babylonian captivity, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, their Babylonian names would not bow to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Nebuchadnezzar gave them a second chance. They declined. They told the king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. The king said, you've got a choice. You can bow or you can burn. You can bow to this image or we will throw you into the burning, fiery furnace. They said this, O king, we will not serve your gods. We will not worship the golden image that you have set up. You see, they love God more than they love their lives. They were rooted in a relationship that gave them faith to overcome their fear. And they feared that God could destroy their souls in a lake of fire more than a king who could destroy their bodies in a furnace of fire. And because they would not bend and they would not bow, God delivered them and they did not burn. Out of weakness, they were made strong. Out of a position of no power, they became powerful. They passed the test of worship. Their companion, Daniel, prayed to God three times a day. And through some manipulation by the governors of King Darius of Persia, the successor kingdom to Babylon, they made it illegal to inquire of God. But Daniel always prayed three times a day. And even when it became illegal to pray, Daniel 
prayed. The king said there's a consequence. I've been set up for this. He realized his folly. Whoever prays to anyone or seeks anyone's advice other than the king is going to be thrown in a den of hangry lions. Hungry and angry, right? It is a challenge of life or death. But Daniel did not budge in his commitment to Almighty God. You see, he believed that the power of God was greater than the power of Persia. And he did what he had always done three times a day. He prayed. And he was thrown in a den of lions. The king favored Daniel. Felt foolish. Couldn't sleep. Went to the door of the den the next day. Wondering. He said, Daniel, was your God able? Did your God save you? And Daniel said, my God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. I'm telling you that if you move from a position of fear into a posture of faith, that there is nothing too hard for God and that you can face any giant that Satan brings up against you at any time in your life. Amen. There will always be a giant. Something bigger and badder than you. But God will empower you. He will deliver you. He will show himself strong on your behalf. Amen. If you will move from fear to faith. And face the giants in your life. When your defiant giant charges you. Hurling insults, looking down on you, trying to intimidate you, to destroy you. Just remember, if they could choose faith over fear, so can I. If they could come out of a position of weakness into a posture of strength, so can I. If they were underdogs who became overcomers, so can I. Amen. The story of David. David is the epitome of an underdog who became an overcomer. In the epic battle against the giant Goliath, they fight to the death. Now, the story of David and Goliath is a real story in history. It's not just a story to tell your kids. And, but when I was a kid, it was my favorite Bible study. My mom is here today to verify that I encouraged mom and dad to name my youngest brother David. And I know that they did exactly what I wanted like they always did or something like that. <laughs> Justin, my son, and I were talking the other day. And we're not talking about this or my baby dedication he said, Dad, I have read the story of David and Goliath to read and mourn for over two weeks. Dear little boy, you just want to grab a sling and slay a giant. I mean, that's how you ought to feel. This is a real battle. But it is also symbolic of the battles that every one of us face in our life. When we are over underrated, when we are the underdog, when there is no way we don't stand a chance of even lasting to the first round of the fight. Amen? Giants that we will always face give us a choice to choose faith over fear. And we can be overwhelmed or we can overcome. Amen? If you don't know this story, you can find it in your Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But you may not know it like I want to tell it. So let's talk about David and Goliath. The Philistines and the Israelites set a battle in array. They're on opposing hills with a valley in between. They both look tough. The Philistines and the Israelites. But Saul is really shaking in his boots. The Philistines find a champion, a giant from Gath. Who comes out for 40 days and taunts Israel. He's got this brass helmet, a 
a coat of mail that weighs 125 pounds. He's got a giant spear with a head made of iron that weighs 15 pounds by our English measurements. He's got this coat of mail that weighs 125 pounds. And when he walks out there, his, you know, his coat of mail is glistering. It's made of bronze. And he's shouting taunts to the armies of the Israelites. And he says, I am a Philistine champion. But you are the servants of Saul. Shoes. One man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your servants. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. And Saul and the Israelites, when they heard this, the Bible said in verse 11, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Now David, meanwhile, is watching his few little sheep on the backside of the family farm and his dad calls him and David leaves the sheep with another shepherd. The Bible says that. And he does a little errand for his dad. He takes some food. He's got some raisin cakes and got some other stuff. He's, there's eight boys in this family. The three oldest are fighting and they're not fighting, but they're in Saul's army, really hiding in Saul's army. And David, this youngest boy, is going to go there and, and he's going to take this basket of grain and loaves of bread and take some cheeses to the captain and David goes there. And meanwhile, 40 days, Goliath is coming out taunting Israel and David gets there to the battle and he hears this. He hears the shouts of the battle, alleged battle. He hears the taunts of Goliath and he's talking to his brothers and some of the other soldiers and he wonders, who is this man? Why is he doing this? And the Bible says that when Goliath taunts them that the Israelite army runs away. David cannot understand this. After all, we are God's people. We don't run from giants. We face our giants. And they say, hey kid, have you seen this giant? Nobody can take him. We're afraid of him. Whoever does, the king will give him his daughter in marriage and make him tax free in Israel and give him a big reward. It's pretty funny in this story that David checks out the reward several times. He wants to make sure what the reward for killing the giant is. And so his older brother Eliab says, who are you? What are you doing? Why did you leave those sheep? You just want to come see the battle. I know your pride and deceit, you know. And David says, is there not a cause? Isn't there something worth fighting for? And he asks this question again and it's reported to King Saul. And the king sends for David, calls him in. I understand some that you want to go fight this giant. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war from his youth. And David begins to testify. You know, you overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. David's got a history with God. He's got a few stories to tell of how God came through in the past. And he tells the story of how a lion came against the sheep and he killed it. How a bear came against the sheep and he killed it, clubbed it to death. And he said, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and of the bear, I know that that same God will rescue me from this Philistine. Amen. He's able. Amen. God is able. And amazingly, for whatever you want to read about this story, Saul says, okay. Saul consents. But he said, you know, David, if you're going to do this, you've got to have armor like he's got armor. Try mine on. David's a teenager. Saul's head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel, but shorter than Goliath. He puts on Saul's heavy armor. It's too big for him. He's never fought in it. Goliath has been practicing in armor like this since he was a boy. I think that's what he got for Christmas every year. A new coat of armor, whatever. David said, I've never fought in this. I've never tried this. I think I'll stick with what I'm comfortable with. 
I think I'll use against the giant what I've always fought with that has always worked for me. He gets his sling. Not a slingshot, but a sling. He goes down to a brook. He gathers five stones. Maybe because of Goliath and his family that he has in his mind. And so here comes David kind of walking this teenage boy, ruddy complected. He looks immature. He's never fought a battle like this. And Dave, Goliath is walking. He's even got an armor bearer bigger than him with his shield in front of Goliath. And he's sneering. I mean, you would too. Looking down your nose at this little kid. Goliath is sneering. And he says, am I a dog? He roars this at David. You're coming after me? With a stick? He curses David to his gods. Come over here. He doesn't say you little punk. But I think that's what he meant. I'm going to give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. And he's yelling the Bible says. And David doesn't budge. He has chosen faith over fear. And he did it a long time ago. This wasn't just the one day that he ever had faith in God. He knew that God is able to deliver him out of the sword of Goliath. Just like he delivered him out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. And David says that you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Amen. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today, David says, I will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. He didn't say the whole world will know that there's a brave shepherd in Israel because David knew I'm standing here as an underdog, but I've got a God that is coming to the battle with me. Amen. He said, this is the Lord's battle. Goliath, big giant that he is, moves closer for attack. But this is my text in 1 Samuel 17, 48. David quickly ran out to meet him. I love that. He's not tiptoeing. He's not hiding behind a bush. He is running to meet Goliath. He has chosen faith over fear. He is facing his giant. He reads into his shepherd's pouch. He pulls out a stone. He has done this many times. People in Israel that were slingers of stones could throw them at a hair's breadth, the Bible said, and not miss. So David can do this, but he is not doing this alone. There's evidently a little vulnerable spot in Goliath's armor, just big enough for a stone to get through. David slings the stone. It sinks with great force into Goliath's forehead. He falls down dead. But so everyone will know that he's dead. David runs to the giant's side. He pulls out his massive sword. He cuts off his head. And there David has conquered Goliath. He has gone from underdog to overcomer by the power of the Lord. The Bible said so David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone for he had no sword. This is the legacy of the people of God. You may look at us. You may look down on us. You may not think that we're bringing much to the battle. But we've got a God who has always fought with us and for us. And we have moved from fear to faith. We will not back down. We will not turn tail and run. We are here for the duration. Amen. We're going to occupy until he comes again. We're going to keep taking territory for the king of kings and the lord of lords we're not running just waiting for the rapture we're here to fight the battle of the lord against sin against evil we're here to establish the kingdom of god on this earth until the catching away of the saints
Amen. Praise God. Everybody else got courageous then. Chased the Philistines, plundered in their camp that had been deserted. Well, David, he's got history with God. And he is not measuring Goliath against himself. He is measuring the giant against his God. Nine times in this passage, David speaks of God's role in this battle. You've defied the armies of the living God. He says it again, the armies of the living God. He said, I'm here for the Lord of hosts. He speaks of the God of the armies of Israel. He says, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That all the assembly may, will know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear. For the battle, David says, is the Lord's. And he finally says, he will give you into our hands. It has never been about David and his valor. It has been about David and his faith in Almighty God. Amen? I believe David was courageous, but he moved from fear to faith. He had confidence in Almighty God. Three verses of this text, 1745. And said David to the Philistine. Thou comest to me with the sword. And with the spear. And with the shield. But I come to you. In the name of the Lord of hosts. That means the God of angel armies. The God of the armies of Israel. Whom thou hast defied. Verse 47. And all this assembly shall know. That the Lord saveth not. With sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Every time you feel underrated, overwhelmed, every time you feel fear creeping in, you know, there is normal fear, natural fear. You should be afraid of some things and take precautions. But the Bible said that God has not given us the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear will attach itself to your normal fears and it will paralyze you and it will defeat you. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Amen. Verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted, here it is, and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Facing your giant. And I repeat the premise of this message. That the Bible is not a book of superheroes. Defeating inferior enemies. But over and over. The Bible is a book about underdogs. Becoming overcomers by the power of Almighty God. And I believe we have the choice every day to be overwhelmed or to overcome. We can decide to fight in our own abilities. We can decide to arm ourselves with this world's weaponry. Or we can choose to fight the way God's people have always fought. We are armed with the power of God. We stand in the armor of God and in the power of His might and in not our own ability. I was recounting some of the battles in the Bible. I actually found a site that listed all the battles in the Bible, but I'm not going to tell you about all of them today. Some Israel lost because they trusted in themselves. Many Israel won because they trusted in God. But let me remind you that we serve a God who has all power in heaven and in earth. Even the winds and the sea obeys him. He can part the Red Sea and make it a path to escape. And he can take that same sea and return it and make it a form of judgment and a grave for the Egyptian army. The Bible says 
that when Israel fought Sisera, that the stars and their courses fought against Sisera. That God used the heavens that he created to fight against the enemies of Israel. In the days of Samuel the prophet, the Bible said that the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines. They became confused and were overcome before Israel. In the days of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, the Lord said, you're not going to have to fight. All I want you to do is put Judah in the front. And I want you to praise the beauty of holiness. And while they worship God, God ambushed the enemy and destroyed them. He doesn't always do it the same way, but he always has the power to win. Amen. When we choose faith over fear. When we move from a position of our ability to God's sovereign, mighty power. In a single night, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers and gave God's people a mighty victory for David, my servant's sake, the Bible says. There are giants in every generation. And yours may not be some nine foot six behemoth. But it's a giant nonetheless. Your giant may be a recurring temptation. That you cannot seem to get away from that's trying to trap you. Your giant may be your looming past that tries to haunt you. And make you feel that you can never escape your regrettable past. Your giant might be a future that frightens you. That scares you half to death. To think of what God has called you to do in your future. Your giant may be the culture that wants to cancel you. Very soon... Our students will go back to school. Some may have already started. And will go into a pagan culture for many people in many places. Not every teacher, I'm not saying that. But that culture will try to cancel you. You may be like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. A minority and a majority of godless people. But if you will stand for God... God will stand with you. Amen. Your giant may be the pressures of life that are crushing you right now. The pressure of bills. The pressure of fractured relationships. The pressure that things will not work out. Your giant may be challenges that are overwhelming you right now. And you do not feel up to the task. And you feel like you need to get some other armor. Get something else to take to the paddle. But I'm just telling you today to take with you what God has given you. What is in your hand, David. Take your staff. Take your sling. Take the weapon of prayer. Take the weapon of praise. Take the weapon of the word of God. Amen. Go to the battle. Run to the battle. Face your giant. Do not walk away. Do not quit. Do not acquiesce. Do not capitulate to the pressures of this day.